Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. And I am excited to talk a little bit about what we are doing. This is um, our uh, PIP or Pandemic Prevention Project funded by the NSF. Um, that Mark talked about earlier. And so this is another one in this mechanism. Uh, my name is Jennifer Surtees and um, I am uh, at the University of Buffalo. And um, I just wanted to start by sharing with you what our grand challenge is for pandemic prevention. So our, basically our, we, have the, we are the Center for Ecosystems Data Integration um, for pan pandemic early warning systems. So our grand challenge is to basically develop a number of streams of data at different levels um, to develop this to that we can integrate to develop an early warning system for outbreaks and pandemics. So the idea is to integrate multiple diverse databases that encompass the viral oops, I'm sorry, the viral ecosystem, um, which is derived from wastewater samples and patient samples. Um, the human ecosystem based on big data, GPS data, cell phone data, um, as well as community level ecosystem information based on talking to the community and members, different members of our community. And so we see this um, development of data and integration into an early one system combined um, with um, communication of our, our findings, solicitation of feedback from our community members, and generating information from our community members to integrate into our um, early warning system as this feedback loop mechanism um, for, for um, generating this um, more robust ecosystem day or uh, early warning system. Um, and so we have as a goal to develop this early warning system, um, but at, also as an equally important goal is to engage with our communities and build real partnerships, um, not only for the generation of data for our early warning system, but also as a mechanism to, to have real partnerships and a, and a trust relationship with our various community members. Because it doesn't matter how good our early warning system is, if when we do issue warnings, the community doesn't respond. And so building that trust um, back is really critical. I'm not going to go through this entire slide. I just want to share with you the fact that this is a highly interdisciplinary um, group and a growing group um, from across the university, across the disciplines, um, ranging from genomics to mathematical modeling, machine learning, engineering, virology, history, disability studies, chemistry, et cetera. And so this is a terrific team. Um, and outside the university, we have partnerships um, with different healthcare systems, New York State, we're part of a New York State whole genome sequencing consortium um, at the moment um, and the Buffalo and Erie County water um, supply. So we have this fantastic network um, to help us generate and implement, integrate and implement the data that we're talking about. Um, and so really we're trying to use our region in Western New York. So again, I'm in Buffalo and we're in Erie County. Um, so we're trying to use our region as a community lab. And so to generate um, data base about our microbial ecosystem, what's happening in terms of the viruses and microbes that are present through both wastewater, which I'll talk and and um, patient uh, individual patient samples. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, and also understanding our human ecosystem, our community relationship and capacity building. Um, we, uh, through a community advisory board, the development of surveys and focus groups, uh, which I will talk about um, in a little bit, but also data mining for and um, GPS monitoring and GPS building and network by building um, for, for the purposes of modeling. So developing these different types of data sets at the microbial system at level, the human level, and then putting them into this predictive modeling hub, hub based on mathematical modeling and machine learning. And then having that output go out 
to our community members, our stakeholders, um, as well as to going feeding back into our analysis of our ecosystems. And really critical to all of this is the communication um, to our stakeholders, to our community members, communication of the science, communication of risk. What level of risk are we at? So what underlies a lot of what we do is, uh, is sequencing. And so I just very quickly want to orient you to, so SARS-CoV-2 sequencing and then beyond to other microbial sequencing um, approaches. And so I just want to orient you to what we're looking at when we look at these phylogenetic trees. And so basically we start off with a, you know, an original SARS-CoV-2, um, the Wuhan virus, if you will. Um, and then over time, as the virus spreads, it um, accumulates mutations. And so we get these different lineages and variants of concern ultimately. And so as we get changes, the, um, we get the branching off of this phylogenetic tree. And so um, in this particular case, we start with this blue sequence, um, but then um, on this clade, it's, a, it's accumulated another new mutation, this orange circle, and then another mutation, um, this green circle. And, and so these two individuals, A and B, have the same lineage and it's this combination of mutations. Um, lineage C is similar, but instead of having this green circle, it's got this red circle. And so while it's closely related, there, it is distinct from lineages A and B. And similarly, we have this other branch point where we have, again, related, um, sorry, related lineages, but with some differences. And so what we've done here in Western New York is, and, and people have done this all over the world, but this is looking at Western New York. This is our phylogenetic analysis of what we've seen throughout the pandemic. And so we've been able to build these phylogenetic trees to really assess what's present in our communities. But what we've also done um, and this ties into our modeling, what we've also been able to do is look more closely at the different lineages to do a cluster analysis. Um, and so by taking, in this case, all of the alpha variants that we have identified in our region and clustering them based on the similarity of the sequences um, using those phylogenetic trees, we can see distinct clusters. And so the more yellow it is, the more similar the the line the alpha lineages actually are so we see these distinct cl clusters labeled one two three and four which are all alpha variants but then have background mutations which make them distinct and by looking at these um these differences we we see we we can it suggests that there are multiple introductions into our community, well as community spread. So different versions have been introduced, and once they're introduced, they spread to other people. Um, and, and this is just shown, you can see this in these phylogenetic trees. Um, what the, these um, arrows are pointing at are actually unique mutations that are actually only ever seen in Western New York, which is kind of cool. Um, the other thing, and, and, and um, we can actually, actually use the spread, tracking the spread of SARS-CoV-2 to actually do um, agent-based modeling, which I'll talk about in a second, to actually um, understand how these different versions of SARS-CoV-2 move around and um, in our community and model that movement based on some of the human data that we will also integrate. Um, one of the things that we did notice, um, so this is actually looking at the different lineages of SARS-CoV-2 across New York State. So these are the different regions of, within New York State and, and the different panels represent the lineages over time, um, in this case in 2020, um, in these different regions. And if you just look at the color patterns, you can see that these, and, and actually we also included Ontario because it's nearby to Buffalo. Um, but if you just look at all of the different patterns, the color patterns in these different regions, you can see there are really significant differences in the patterns of which version of SARS-CoV-2 is present, even in regions that are very close together. Um, and this was even more um, evident when we look in our 2021, and I'm not going to show, but we, this is also true in 2022. So we think we can use this, um, this 
distribution and variation in distribution over time as a way of modeling the spread of SARS-CoV-2 um, over the throughout the state as well as within Erie County um, over time. And so this is just again showing a time lapse uh, snapshot of the alpha variant um, in New York State, where it was localized and when, um, with the more yellow being the more, more prevalent. And you can see it starting out um, in um, downstate and eastern New York and then gradually spreading. But the timing of the, this variant is, is distinct depending on what part of New York you're in. And this is just actually showing, a, uh, this is just a GIF of showing the alpha variant um, moving in, around New York State over time. And this is just the New York variant um, to compare. And you can see differential um, migration and differential movement of these two lineages over time. Um, and so by incorporating things like traffic patterns um, and developing agent-based modeling, we're doing network analysis with across New York State and within Erie County to understand the movement of the virus through time. Um, the other thing that we've been doing, and this is, you know, in, uh, with work with um, our engineering collaborators who, Yin Yin Yi and Ian Bradley, who over the course of the pandemic were tracking levels of RNA um, in our wastewater. So this is just a cartoon of wastewater, um, uh, collecting wastewater uh, data. So this is our wastewater, wastewater, and then these are the SARS-CoV-2 viruses that are present in our wastewater. So over the course of the pandemic, they looked at levels of RNA through, as, a, as a function of time. And then about a year and a half ago, we actually developed techniques for doing sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater as well. And so what we actually, this is just showing patient samples, individual samples, and again, the colors are different lineages of SARS-CoV-2, and this is a, as a function of time on the x-axis. And when we look at four different um, sewer sheds, we can see um, that the type, the virus type itself um, is similar among the, the, the sewer sheds, although there are some differences, but the patterns are actually different than what we see um, in the patient samples. And, and so the wastewater samples is actually a pooled sample of everything in our community. Um, and so it's really interesting to look at the differences between the patient and the wastewater samples. Patient samples being a little bit more biased um, in terms of just who's actually getting, um, getting sequenced. And so of course the wastewater can be used to monitor for different known and novel pathogens. Um, and so this is what we're actually doing now. And of course, in order to, to really do this in a meaningful way, we need community cooperation and trust. And so now I'm just showing you the same diagram, but here I've added in a whole bunch more squiggles and triangles um, to indicate that we're not just sequencing COVID anymore, we're sequencing all of the RNA um, that's present in the wastewater. Um, after depleting for mRNA and rRNA so that we can enrich for some of the microbial and particularly viral RNAs. And the idea here is to develop a longitudinal picture of the viral and microbial ecosystem over time so that we can have, get a sense of what's normally there so that if it's disrupted, um, we can notice and then we will notice and start looking at, looking for it in more detail at what might be present. So this is a way of detecting not only known pathogens, but potentially unknown pathogens as well. Um, and one of the other things that we're really excited to do is to incorporate um, mass spectrometry to detect pharmaceuticals um, in the wastewater as well, because it looks like the uptick in ibuprofen and, and that sort of thing actually precedes this, an uptick or a spike in cases. Um, we're also looking at the community level to, to really try to understand what biomarkers, what key questions do we need to ask our community partners in order to feed in modeling and anticipate an outbreak. So we're collecting oral histories. We're doing focus groups and interviews with different communities across Western New York. This involves a discussion of community concerns and interests, including the ethical issues that were mentioned earlier. And we have a strong community advisory board as well to help um, advise and to help us with our communication. Um, and again, this data gets feed, fed back into our models. 
So I also mentioned the importance of community engagement, and we have actually a really robust track record and set of partners um, to do community engagement, both in our K-12 schools and within our community, more broadly speaking. And these are just some images of, of some of the community engagement events and activities that we've done over the past seven or eight years. So we're leveraging those partners now, as well as a partnership with the Buffalo Museum of Science, um, to actually to do a lot of community partnership building, hands-on type research. Um, and this is one of our first um, sort of demonstrations for community engagement at the Museum of Science, where we have just have this demo of what wastewater actually is and how we collect um, all of the those samples from within a neighborhood in order to get a, a big picture, a broad picture um, of what's going on at the viral level and the microbial level um, in our communities and how we use that to um, predict and hopefully prevent pandemics. So I will stop there. <laughs>